So, we have this afternoon Jake Morse. Try to tell me your lineage is first the queen, but no, forget it. You have that. Jake was looking at the line of succession the other day, just in case he, he should become English royalty, which is odd because his thesis has nothing at all to do with that. Uh, his thesis chair uh, was Brittany Williams, uh, also on the committee. It was Garth Rock Castle, and yours truly, Jake. Let's go to Great Falls. Thanks for coming out today, everyone. <clears throat> Before I get started, I want to thank uh, my thesis chair, Brittany Williams. Uh, without your help and guidance, the project wouldn't be able to come to where it is today. I also want to thank the rest of the committee, Professors uh, Tillman, Rockcastle, and Kelly. Um, and I also want to thank the other students in the studio. Without you guys, it wouldn't have been as much fun the past few years. And so I want to take you to our wild, uh, looking at how architecture can catalyze ecological revitalization on the Potomac River. <clears throat> and what drew me to this thesis was spending a lot of time in the more wild places of uh, our nation like this. Um, and then coming back to places like this, where most of the human population lives, um, in landscapes that have been completely engineered and altered by us architects, uh, disconnected from their natural origins. Um, however, despite this disconnection, uh, we still have a great dependency on these natural ecosystems for such basic necessities such as food, um, materials, water, and joy. Um, but we're not the only ones that depend on these ecosystems. We also share them with thousands and thousands of other creatures, uh, from the smallest to the biggest, and everything in between. But our role in this ecosystem hasn't been such a positive one as of late. Uh, because of our actions on the environment of this planet, uh, these wild populations are starting to disappear. And once they're gone, they'll be gone for good. Uh, so wild animal numbers are expected to continue to plummet 67%. Uh, from 1970 populations by 2020. So this is quite a devastating and large statistic. Um, and historically, it's estimated around 10 species were lost a year due to things like background extinction um, and natural selection. But today, because of the human factor, it's estimated 100,000 species are lost a year. And to scale that down a little bit, that comes out to around 10 species an hour. So during the length of this presentation, 10 species that have evolved over millions of years will disappear. Uh, from our shrinking rainforests to our dying coral reefs, um, and even here in Maryland, where there are currently 514 native animals listed as endangered and threatened. So not only is this a global problem, but it's a local problem as well. Um, and this is mainly due to habitat loss and pollution, uh, two human factors. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to have a quote from the Lorex. I am the Lorex, I speak for the trees, I speak for the trees, for the trees have no times. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs, what's that thing you made out of my truffle up top? So I think with this thesis, we can start to um, have society change into a little bit of the Lorex. So speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves, and becoming stewards, um, caretakers of the environment. Um, and so I want to take a look at the Potomac River, which is one of many waterways throughout the nation. So while I'm looking at this thesis through a more local scope, it can be applied um, in many places in waterways in America. Uh, so looking a little bit closer at the Potomac River watershed area, it's about 14 and a half thousand square miles, stretching from Pennsylvania to Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and DC. Um, and it uh, contains around, supports around six million people who take about 540 million gallons of water from these waterways every day. Uh, to give you a little bit of comparison, the river um, has an average daily flow of about 7 billion gallons, so this is quite a significant chunk we're taking out for human use. And despite our great dependency on this waterway, um, we don't treat it so well. Uh, we deposit around 2.5 million tons of sediment into it a year, coming from things like constructed sites, uh, and tons of different chemicals coming from urban, suburban, agricultural, industrial uses and runoff. Um, and from DC alone, three billion gallons of raw sewage enter the river every year. Uh, so to give a little bit of historical context to human, um, human, American humans on the river, uh, back in 1784, George Washington created the Potomac Company, um, and he set out to create a series of skirting canals around the uh, wild waterfalls and rapids of the Potomac um, to link DC to the Ohio River Valley uh, through a trade route. And this was completed uh, it resulted in the completion of the Sino Canal in 1850, which was a 185 mile waterway stretching from um, DC to Cumberland. And during the golden era of the canal, 
Uh, it, boats were shipping around a million tons of cargo, um, mostly coal, a lot of agricultural goods. Um, but eventually, the railroad technology caught up, outpaced, and outpriced it, and the casino ended up closing in 1924, sold to the U.S. government during the Great Depression, and then became a National Historic Park in 1971. Uh, so this is really a story of uh, humanity's taming of this natural body of water uh, for industrial use, its abandonment, and then as you can see in the last image here, uh, the reemergence of the forest and the wildlife that inhabit. <clears throat> and part of the reemergence of uh, natural elements is large in part due to the um, conservation movement of the 60s and 70s, uh, which resulted in a series of acts that began to regulate um, and standardize some of the uh, things that were resulting in negative effects on this ecosystem. Uh, and I propose continuing that um, by looking at three different scopes of wildlife, water, and forest in this thesis project, um, and programmatically looking at wildlife rescue and rehabilitation, as well as research, monitoring, and experimentation uh, to maintain and achieve a healthy river um, ecosystem um, and become stewards of the Potomac. But there's also an educate or a public factor to this thesis, looking at ecological education, as well as real experiences to um, begin to instill an empathy um, and environmental uh, link from the public to the river ecosystem and uh, the surrounding communities. So my site is Riley's Lot, which is located about half an hour away from DC, uh, and pulls from a local regional population of about three and a half million people within a 20 mile radius. Um, and uh, a lot of these satellite cities are within 40 to um, 30, 20 minute drives from the site. I'm looking a little bit closer, Riley's Lock sits at the head of Seneca Creek, which divides residential and agricultural land use on the north side, Maryland side of the river. And this site um, historically had uh, the Seneca Aqueduct, which carried water and boats across um, the creek uh, to continue down the canal. And today, um, that has fallen into ruin, and nature has literally um, come back onto it with trees regrowing <coughs> from the sides. And it was also uh, home to the Seneca sandstone quarries, um, which created stones like this for buildings around Washington, D.C., like the Smithsonian Castle and many others. Uh, but that has since closed, and um, the forest has since regrown and come back to that site as well. Uh, for my building site, I chose the Seneca Stone Cutting Mill, uh, which once was quite an industrial site, and now um, is again, like the other elements, has become regrown by the forest or recaptured. <clears throat> and that sits on the basin, which is one of three elements of water on the site, including Seneca Creek, seen here from the aqueduct, and the Potomac River. And you can see all these bodies of water on the site map. So the building is located on the edge of uh, the ruins here in the hillside, and that is in part to take a lot of the massing up um, out of the 100-year uh, flood, 30-foot inundation flood plain. <clears throat> so that leaves a lot of the more permanent programming on the upper hillside. Uh, and looking at a site aerial, you can begin to see the approach that visitors would take coming down Riley's Lock Road, visiting the lock house, and being able to go around this um, trail and water walk around the basin, where they can visit um, the Seneca Conservancy. Um, access can also be taken from the mill road, and employee access can be achieved through this uplands road uh, to the back of the building. And jumping into a little bit of how I came about the design of the building, I took a look at how canal boats used to um, traverse down the CNO, how they would come from the upstream higher level, lock in um, to the lock, and then uh, drainage doors would open, lowering the level and allowing the boat to continue onwards. Uh, so this idea of uh, movement along a main water axis um, and changing levels is something I brought into the building itself. I also took a look at the history of the site, and the mill uh, began a little, a little bit more humbly in 1837, and then was expanded as the industry grew in 1855. So I took this idea of segmented growth <clears throat> to achieve um, the massing up the hillside. And so this is what it looks like today, where the forest has largely come back, <clears throat> and the ruin part of it still stands. So I've left the ruin relatively unchanged and inserted a, a pavilion into half of it where people can learn about the site um, and the industry that once existed. Um, and then along this main axis, the building extends backward into the hillside as a grotto, 
which is then capped by a circulation and view tower. Uh, and then uh, the research insertion is partially in the hillside, which is then capped by the wildlife hospital. I also included a series of landscaping elements, such as this um, elevated walkway going back to Seneca Creek, this trail going back to the Ceno towpath, and this water walk going along the basin. Uh, so in addition to these landscaping elements connecting my building back into the forest and the water elements of the site, I've also looked at the basin as a chance to create this experiment with the building uh, and see how if we took all these uh, chemicals out of the runoff and treated them through the building and remediated this basin, how that would create a healthier um, ecosystem, both for wildlife and for humans to enjoy. Uh, and then zooming in a little bit to the building, how this would work. Um, the basin input would come in, get filtered through a series of filtration processes. Part of it would be used for the building, and the majority of it would come out through the ruin, uh, powering micro hydroelectric turbines to power this process, and then coming out of the basin uh, to begin that remediation. And so this is kind of a smaller um, experiment that can be then used to push for environmental um, activism to hopefully get it on the scale of the ruin. Uh, some more sustainable strategies I've used in the design was using these uh, operable glazing and these two tower elements to create uh, natural ventilation through the process of convection, cool air moving lower down and pushing hotter air up uh, further above, and also looking at the southeastern orientation of the ruins and then the building, and how uh, winter sunlight can filter through uh, the dormant canopy and summer sunlight can be um, blocked a little bit by the canopy when it's fully grown. Uh, and then taking you all through um, the programming in terms of plan, um, coming out into the landscaping elements, there's this water walk where a lot of outdoor education opportunities can occur. Um, mollusk restoration can occur and appear here, um, where different mussels and clams can be grown and planted back in the basin and the Potomac River um, to make up for lost populations. Then moving into the ruin itself, uh, visitors can look at the micro hydroelectric turbines uh, coming out of this channel where the water's been brought back, um, and then coming back into the grotto, they can see the different filtration systems um, working to clean the basin and the water from the building. And moving a little bit further back into the grotto, uh, these technological aspects can help connect users to the wildlife through live streams of animals being treated in the hospital above, as well as holograms, so users can interact with um, different animals that they may not be able to in the wild. Uh, and then coming up to the second level, uh, people can exit the tower back onto the landscape to the Potomac Garden where native vegetation is displayed for people to learn about and bring the knowledge back with them to their communities. And then on the third level is the research center where research and monitoring and experimentation is taking place. And then the fourth level of the wildlife hospital um, where visitors can see the animals being treated and learn about the different wildlife of, the, uh, of Maryland and the Potomac ecosystem. And then finally coming to the sixth level in the observation deck where um, visitors can look out to the Potomac and see where they've come from at the end of their journey. Um, and I'd like to take you through a little animation. So this is the approach from the CNO towpath, looking out the, at the uh, docks beyond and the outflow of the basin water in the tower above. Coming into the first portion of the ruins, which has been left open. <clears throat> and moving into the pavilion portion, where you can see the turbines uh, in the channel there. And so constantly moving on and off this main axis of water uh, from the original ruin, and looking out at the path to the docks in the basin. What's the original water? Uh, to power the mechanics that um, for the stone cutting there. Uh, so looking at this skylight that mirrors the um, mill water moving in, you can see the source of the water coming out, as well as the mechanical systems um, filtering it. And then moving into the hologram room, we can see visitors interacting with projections of different animals. And then the wildlife streaming uh, room on the right. And finally, the base of the tower, where they can see the water coming out. Moving, moving off that main axis of water, uh, similar to the canal boats rising up along with it. And 
uh, coming out to the Potomac Garden, and the path going back to Santa Cruz Creek. Looking back where they came from in the ruins. And throughout the design, I wanted the tower, as well as the um, docks of the basin, to stand as <coughs> landmarks and orientating devices. Um, and you can see the tower nestled into the hillside here with the stone, and then emerging from that, the timber structure. And as visitors move up the tower, they're getting better and better views at um, the site and the basin itself. And then visitors on special tours can visit the research center and the laboratories going on within, um, which is partially embedded into the hillside with this courtyard bringing natural light to the central gathering space with meeting rooms and offices on the left. Again, ascending even further and getting more and more of that view out above the tree canopy through it. And again, visitors, maybe students on field trips, uh, can come into the Wildlife Center. And here they can get a peek into the operation of the building. <coughs> the food prep to the left of the animals we treat in the space, a small surgery room, and a treatment space here. Moving out of the um, enclosure of the tower um, to the observation decks, this one about level of the canopy. And looking at the operable um, phasing of the tower itself, allowing that ventilation. Looking back down to see where they've come from. Finally getting out to the observation deck, looking at Oops. looking out over the site and at the Potomac River beyond and the docks here. This uh, building is designed for all seasons, spring showers, fall. Winter. And with that, I'd like to open up for uh, questions and comments. basin here is part of the CMO. Um, it's wider here to allow boats to turn around and stay for the night. So you can see it on the side map. And here we come across the aqueduct. And where, where does it continue on the other side of the lock um, So it's dry here um, in modern times. Um, but it would continue along this trail. And this is towards DC? Yeah. And what was the function of the basin? Like, what, why was it? Is it natural or is it man made? It's man made. And what was the reason for it? Uh, so, this is a water part of the canal to allow boats to turn around um, and also to like stay for the night as it's making a three day trip down to DC. And also, the water now that you're sort of treating in, you're taking it uphill and then bringing it back down. Yeah, so taking it up to the base here. Um, so a slight gain uh, through like pumps powered by the sure. uh, turbines. Yeah. And, okay. and that's just to go through the, is there anything that has to do with gravity in terms of how you're treating the water? Is that, can't you just treat it terra firma rather than, 
I mean, it makes for an interesting story. I mean, mm -hmm. the animation is that water always goes down the hill, right? Yeah. But you're sort of forcing it to go uphill. That's true. Empowering it to go up in the tree and then come back down. Is there yeah. something that says it can't be treated at the same level? Um, or is it part of the story? I think it's part of the story. Okay. Also, to bring the water back into the mill, to reanimate that um, sequence that the water once went through coming out of the mill here. So, you know, um, Richard Myers, is it Smithers? Somebody go. Is it? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yes. 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 It does it. Does, 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 I'm sorry. Yes. The one that it's sort of person is a sectional problem, like a sectional investigation, and you know, trying to solve the site sectionally. Mm -hmm. You bring most people off of that road, right? But the employee is the one that are coming in from the top. I want. Did you look at switching it so that your series of experiences? It's much more natural. Like you sort of you start at the top, you get the view, and you sort of cascade down the hill, mm -hmm. just as the water would. You know, you're trying to bring on the site, rather than. I guess you're gonna have to do that trip one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You just start at the top, get all the experiences, come down, and then find your way back to parking the, the hill. Or you start at the bottom, go experience everything, and then you have to come back down the hill. Why yeah. did you settle? On so that? the main reason I left um, employee access up top and visitor access up bottom. Um, was because the more permanent elements, like the wildlife hospital uphill, uh, needed to be placed there uh, out of the floodplain, and then also the animal runs uh, and like holdings for the animals being treated would have to be up there as well. So separating that from the public access was important for that type of programming. Um. And I wonder if you could still solve it. Sorry, if you could still solve it. Here, here, here. <laughs> if you could still solve the dilemma by having people coming on top, even though they're coming into the animal cons conser conservancy portion, mm -hmm. uh, experience all of that and then see how this facility functions as you go down the hill, yeah. rather than letting the tail wag the dog, so to speak. That's what you're saying. Instead of letting the procession dictate how you go to, you know, where you, access to the site dictate your experience, but I think you can actually put a stance on that and actually have a viewpoint and say, okay, this is how I want, I can have both, I can have my cake and eat it too, but sort of having them, having them at the top and go down the hill naturally. Because um, there's something to be said about sort of arriving on the site and you sort of get what the program is about, it's about the animal conservancy, about water preservation and all that stuff, get the great view to the Potomac and then you sort of naturally cascade downhill mm -hmm. and you sort of get these elements as you go down towards the basin rather than the way the water has been forced to go uphill, which mm -hmm. seems, it feels unnatural in yeah. a way. Um, so. yeah. I think that's the reason why I kind of kept that element hidden um, and more expressed the element of the water cascading. Up. I guess you're going a little bit against the current, right. so to speak. Okay. Okay. So if that's what you're going to start with, Mende, really? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> This is a great project. Of course. So, um, I, I, what I'm most impressed by, we've seen a, a series of theses that, um, you know, each person is very passionate about what they're researching um, and trying to translate that into architecture or site planning and all that. And you've literally uh, done what others maybe haven't achieved, which is got your, your architecture to, to heal the situation that you're most passionate about. So I commend you for that. You've integrated your research into what is um, a quite feasible way to treat water. And it's, it, this is, you know, despite the pumps uh, to get the water there, this is a historic, this is a, since the beginning of time, people have been using gravity and sand and, and, and aggregate to clean water. So. Um, credit for understanding that. Very simple means and uh, respecting the resources that are there, which I think wasn't present in other projects, and, and actively using them not only as a, an understanding of the site, but uh, but a great space to, to experience. And it's about the site, and it's about the context, and it's about the history. So again, I'm really impressed at how thoughtful you've taken the research and applied 
applied it here and used what's there, the inherent architecture of the site, of the, the, the artifacts that are there, the resources that are there. Um, and it, to me, it's very viable. I mean, I would, there's all kinds of hiking trails you can go to to find this place. Um, I think you could build it tomorrow. You just get the funds and go for it. Um, <laughs> And, and, and the every, you've been very thoughtful about every experience in and out of your building about not only the animals, uh, but the flora and fauna and, and, and how this is a healing uh, structure. So um, I'll start with that and then, then people can complain about how you get there. Thank you. Huh. This is a really great project. It's. Um, it's a great project because it uh, combines many aspects and uh, all the aspects are resolved very well, starting from the ruins. So for me it's an incredible historic preservation project. It's absolutely a great relationship with the landscape. So it's an interesting landscape project too. Design, of course, architecture, typologically. Because you start from the pre-existing bay, they give the dimension of your design. Uh, this section actually is the best way to represent your project, any project. But in this particular case, uh, it uh, gives us the opportunity to really enjoy, understand, uh, and go inside of your project. I really love the material that uh, you use uh, it perfectly. You know, relation with the uh, environment around. And of course, uh, at the end, uh, this is a fit perfectly with the context. So, this context, uh, you know, is not just urban context, you know, context, uh, context is uh, everywhere, also in the middle of the desert. Um, it personally reminds me also the Florentine Altana that <laughs> we're talking about a lot. And so I'm really glad uh, to find this kind of aspect. Uh, at the end, the interiors too. It's uh, amazing. Yeah. Materials. So I, I really enjoy it. Really like. Thank you. <coughs> it, uh, like everybody else, it, it's, it's, enormously, it's enormously complete. Um, and it must be enormously satisfying to sort of pull it all together. Um, as a design critic, the, my, my gut instinct is that, that uh, you've, you've, uh, you've satisfied the problem and it, it's almost like you've aimed at a developer and I'm saying that with a certain negativity rather than going for, and I'm struggling with it because I don't, there's something that isn't quite there yet, I'm just making magic spaces. It, it, the, the target is, is, is low, I think, in so much as the idea that you have is huge. I mean, it's reusing these amazing artifacts that exist there. And it seems safe in so much as a developer will come and put their money down, rather than so extraordinary that they would shy away because it would cost too much. And, and I guess what I'm, in my mind, I'm sort of dealing with this, this notion of aspiration. Um, it's a big, big idea. What do we do with our historic artifacts? How do we celebrate them? How do we use the design that we do to amplify what was there, to call into question what's good and bad, how to speculate for it? And I, it's, it's such a backhanded thing because in the first instance, I want to make absolutely categorically clear. It's brilliant. It's so well done. And then I want you to go further. What, what, what kind of spaces would they be? It, it seems like a tower. It's a slightly romantic, looks 19th century vaguely, and I'm thinking, okay, it's 21st century. What are your aspirations? Where do you take it? Where do you push the envelope? What are the spaces you come up with? If we have that space up at the top, what are we looking at? What, what is the qualitative aspect of that space, rather than just, it's a staircase going up? And I, I guess for me, the, the visual clues, the visual imagery reminds me of sort of Disney movie kind of thing. Exactly. There it is. It's, it's, it's video game. That was exactly what I was going to Thank you. Um, but that's not a bad thing. It's not at all a bad thing. That, that people who have played that game, people who played those games, 
have incredible three-dimensional skills. No, no. Please, please don't misunderstand me. It, it, because if I'm saying great, this is an A plus. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going. Okay, so I'll be on A plus. Where do you go? What is, what is your imagery that you're exploring? Because this is all normative. Mm -hmm. it, were I working with you, I'd be sitting there going, okay, give me a detail that, that I have brought. Why that? that? That seems sort of, I don't know what it is. I mean, what is your aspect of craft? What, what, how do you bring this to the table? Right. Your, your stones don't work. You don't seem to understand yet about lentils. And yet, you certainly have been looking at them. What do you, what do you bring to the, how do you talk about new and old together? I'm only putting all these things out there because this is this is where you're going forward, uh, going towards from here. And I certainly will be sitting there cheering for the sun because it will be really fun. Amen. Sorry. Sure. It's, it's a great point. Uh, it's a great point because I again I always go with some of the other peers I presented earlier to sort of ask them about, about the precedents that they looked at. You look at the work of someone like Scott, right, where he takes old stuff and sort of imbues it with something uh, new. Mm -hmm. But there's always this tension that he plays with the old and the new and how they come together. Now he details stuff. I would, you know, I love your animation and I love your project, great work. But at the same time, I actually think the rendering tool that you use, I don't know what software that you use. What software did you use for anybody? Um, a little bit of Photoshop and Lumion. Um, I actually think it does your project a little bit of disservice. Because mm -hmm. again, it's sort of look, it's cartoonish, yeah. cartoonish, except for those last three shots that you have. I showed the seasonal images, the sort of fall look and the winter look. Those are brilliant. But as you're taking us to these and the people and sort of like the finer details, mm -hmm. the poetics of these, uh, of this, these spaces, the marvelous spaces that you've created, I think they get lost in the rendering engine that you use. Yes. So at some point you kind of have to go, is this helping me tell my story or is it actually hindering me? Because it looks like you just did screenshots from the animation and put them up. But I wonder if you had just decided on a few spaces to highlight and either to pen or whatever, or even if you're rendering it, just go to Tana and maybe mm -hmm. be poetic to sort of go to the aspirational aspect that he's talking about. Because yes, you've checked all the boxes, you've solved something, you've, solved, you've created, a, you looked at a problem, looked at what the issues are, and you've solved it. Now what? You know, we now we know you can solve it. Obviously, you're quite adept at technically handling some of these things. But then now, when I look at that section, again, I mentioned the Douglas House. This sort of sexual issue. You could have made, and you actually decided to make it the center of your presentation, which it should be. Mm -hmm. But I think rendering it and taking it to that next level to make it aspirational and romantic. I think that's sort of like the next step. Not that you've done a bad job, but always aim higher, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you've created a very complete world, and it's, it has this kind of very organic quality to it that you know, um, you know, you find in, in a video game, I suppose. And 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 so, from a historic preservation standpoint, I guess if you, <laughs> I think it's the mic. Okay. Um, it, you know. I, I wonder what came first. Was it was it the the kind of uh, the half timber expression, or was it the uh, you know the ruin that kind of was the big inspiration? Because there's a point where it becomes a little ambiguous. You know uh, what is you know what was there before, and what is part of this new world that you've created. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, especially with the grotto space, where you're kind of really kind of uh, adding on to the, the ruin in a way, using the same material and the same, uh, and, and the canal is kind of continuous, the handrails are continuous, so there's a lot of things that are creating continuities between old and new, between, you know, the historic artifact and, and this kind of new piece of program that you've added on. And, um, there's also this kind of uh, stacking that I notice you're always doing this kind of stepping up the hill and using this kind of width of the of the of the uh, ruin as your kind of uh, module for your your kind of dimension and and so um, you know in terms of process it's not not so much about 
the final product, you know, uh, to me, it, it, it's, it's a little, uh, I, I want to see you really wrestling with this, okay, what is that dialogue between old and new, or really wrestling with, um, you know, where is the water coming from? Uh, because I see the agricultural runoff in your diagram, which to me is a huge problem. I mean, I, I know that the, uh, you know, the river may be polluted, but one of the reasons why it's, you know, it's struggling for survival is, is all of these chemicals that are coming from our lawns and from our agricultural areas. So is there a way of integrating that into it? Um, is there a way of, I mean, this quarry wall, I really want to understand where that is and to, to understand, you know, to have that more a kind of feature in, in this. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think we, you know, I get, I kind of forgot about the whole history part, which is where you started with the canal and all that, and I very quickly got caught up with this this whole new kind of world that you created. <laughs> and then I had to remind myself, oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in Washington, I'm on the Potomac, I'm on here. <laughs> because it kind of really transports you to this other place. Did you want to? Oh, it's okay. Um, agree with everyone here. It's a beautiful, beautiful project, beautifully presented. The animation was uh, amazing. Um, I think your section drawing, both here and I, I like the 2D version almost uh, as much um, because it shows everything kind of relative to each other, true to true to scale, but um, that's really your killer drawing, and to speak to um, Edgar's comment about where the ruins stop and the new begins. Um, I'm kind of, kind of torn because I love that there's this kind of seamless um, transition between the ruins and then you almost don't realize, okay, now I'm undercover. I um, mean, you almost never feel like you're undercover which it feels very much like an indoor-outdoor experience. So part of me is, I like that you've used the rough stone, um, but then you, there could have been kind of a really interesting threshold and transition to um, the modern, the man-made, even mm -hmm. though it reaches the ground. Like speaking to Carlos Scarpa, it could have been stone that's more machined and perhaps steel lentils that um, create the opening so that you're expressing a sort of more modern um, building techniques. Um, as far as the renderings go, it, it's tough because these rendering programs, I can't stand how they render trees. I mean, I can see every single leaf there and we know that that's, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's how they are. And so I wondered if um, some of your renderings might um, capture the, the the dialogue between kind of the crisp architectonics of your building, beautifully integrated in the site and section, with kind of the soft um, uh, landscape of the tree foliage or um, the tree. You know, it'd be interesting to see this with um, in the winter. See this kind of rendering in the winter. And I think the techniques are there. I think you can can you turn the trees off and just draw them in as you want. Or um, I guess that. That section drawing kind of explores that a little mm -hmm. bit more. One, one thing I'll pick on is your elevator. Um, <laughs> um, it's a reality. Um, unfortunately, the person who has to take the elevator has a very different experience. Um, I would encourage you to um, explore their experience as very much a transparent experience, similar to those who are able to take the walk up to the top um, because you're, you're basically in a shaft and then when you you know get to your floor level you get this burst of the outdoors kind of powerful in a way but it's really it's very different than what everybody else yeah I think if I I'm sure you struggled with that yeah I struggled with the placement but also I think if I reworked it I would just have the shaft transparent it's like a hydro I wouldn't put it in the metal it's just, it's just mm -hmm. it, could, it could have been in a wood and glass structure okay. Thank you. I think we're all sort of entrenched, and therefore it's hard to to put on another kind of lens, a critical lens. In your in your 
it's an additive process, and everything you've added actually is opposite to the way it would have been developed. Because the original developed first building, and then the easier ways to go towards the water, I think they, we would continue to do that. Going up the hill is, is counter, uh, counter counterintuitive and, 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 it, and incredibly hard, too, in terms of construction. Yeah, the amount of devastation you have to do in terms of the land to bring resources in. But even so, you're constantly building in your own, into your own view plane. So each building you're putting in is actually looking at the back end of the one you just put up. And so you're, if you were to stand and look in section at that end and look out, every time you're putting something in, you're looking at something you've just built rather than celebrating the landscape, which would suggest that you probably want to go horizontally. Mm -hmm. Certainly for your last research part, um, and presumably the kind of people you're, you're getting in, to put something in you know, 18th century, roughly, lodge kind of thing, you're, you're going, well, maybe, but maybe it's really whatever 21st century is or represents. And I, I, I said that earlier, but sort of the imagery, perhaps the new does build on the old, and, and therefore, what might that be? And, and certainly you're talking about in terms of environmentally, I mean, technology and the like. There, there's another conversation, too, which you were just alluding to about the trees, which is the whole conversation of representation. These are very standard kind of representation of perspective. There's, there are other kinds of representation, um, both in terms of the computer, but, but what you're trying to do. And I think the question there is, is, what do you want to say and why do you want to say it? And then figure out the way to say it with, with whatever you know. That's the part of an education is to expand out and to expand and to increase your knowledge base rather than just iter iterations of what you've done. There was an article uh, four or five months ago in, oh gosh, uh, I can't remember, where, where they're talking about new forms of computer uh, representation. There's an office out of Belton called Office. Um, I, I saw an exhibit of theirs up in Montreal where, um, where they're actually co-opting uh, imagery from famous paintings to explore and create the feeling. Uh, uh, two Belgian guys, uh, there is an Alan Croquy about them, and there's a, they have three books out, it's only 150 bucks. Um, um, it's office of this care or stunt or something like that. I, I'm not good at Belgian. Uh, First thing here is David that's where There we go. Sir. Um, and, and the work they're doing and the kind of drawings and the kind of representation is incredible. Um, and, and there's a there's a similar kind of naivete, deliberate naivete in the, in the drawings, which are uh, uh, similar to what uh, Madeleine Fr uh, Friesendorf was doing with Ohm, Ohm at the beginning of Renner's career, with, with these drawings where they tell it's an allegoric, and the narrative is reinforcing what they're trying to do. And I think that's something you could really, really have some fun with. Whole new territory. Mm -hmm. You've discovered this. Now, now shoot higher, sir. It's a thank you. Um, so I'm looking at some of the earlier stuff that you've done here, and I actually wonder if you ever looked at any formal type to solving your problem. Um, the more I look at your project, especially when I look at that certain image that section, you're kind of using that tower as a device for scaling the mountain. Mm -hmm. You sort of have this tall thing that allows you to come in higher, you know, it's classic, right? It allows you to transverse the, the topography. But did you look at any other means in terms of, is it a collective of small pavilions that sort of march their way up, creating this sort of experiential route mm -hmm. up and down? the way water would flow naturally, because water just doesn't shoot down the plane right. in a straight axis, it sort of meanders where it finds the least common, least path of resistance, so it goes downhill, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder if you sort of explored that. Yes, you may not have ended up there, but did you explore that as part of your earlier studies? Second question, you've been to the Guggenheim in New York, right? Franklin writes, oh, you have to, this summer when you graduate. Make that a stop. Okay. And when you go in, depending on whatever ex exhibit is on display, ask yourself how you want to uh, experience this. Do you want to start at the bottom and go up those ramps, mm -hmm. taking momentary pauses as you go up? Or do you want to take the elevator up all the way and do the natural thing and sort of wind your way down? Now, the choice is left to the participant, right? But I think it would actually, 
inform you as to the organizational strategy that you've set up or that you're willing to set up you know, for the project or even exploring it in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised you didn't, I mentioned um, uh, Richard Meyer Douglas as, as well as Frank Lloyd Wright because mm -hmm. it's, it's an experiential sectional problem that I think you should even look it up. You don't even have to go visit. Just look it up and see and read about it because I think it will be very, very telling. But if you can answer that first question. I'll sure. Like. Um, so some of the original schemes I looked at um, had the programming coming up the hillside here to meet the ruins. Um, and I think a lot of these schemes that originally branched out or even had the programming spread out more, um, it started to enroach too much on the forest. And so I think this was the scheme I came up with to condense that as much as possible so that it didn't interrupt or it minimized interruption. Um, and so by kind of concentrating that sort of vertical circulation within the central tower to service um, the research center and the hospital and the ruins, um, that was um, a technique that helped me achieve as minimal as a impact for the type of program. Yeah. So you kind of, um, sorry, I Um, so why, let's focus on the actual tectonics of the architecture that you chose. Why did you choose this heavy timber, that tutory, <laughs> ski lodge? So I looked at um, kind of finding this balance between the language of the ruins, the pre-existing architecture, and also the language of the forest, since there wasn't as much urban context, things like that, to draw on from. Um, so kind of inscribing that into the language of the timber um, and the trusses um, that were in the building uh, to try and get it to not interrupt so much but become a landmark that was of the forest instead of apart from it. It's, so it's, it's really taking away from your concept. I think mm -hmm. what Minde, what you're talking about, about the sectional experience, the, um, there could have been more, one, I think there could have been more volumetric expression of how the water is being filtered, so you would see, instead of noticing the, the elevator is the most vertical element, maybe it's how the water gets pumped up there and seeing it more as vertical piece. And secondly, the, what you're showing, I mean, I think when you pick something, a certain tectonic or construction type, you have to really understand how it's working. So right now, like, it's way overstructured, even for like a heavy timber structure that's not vernacular mm -hmm. necessarily to that. So, you know, maybe interpret that in steel, or just start taking elements, edit it a lot more, um, and that might help with the expression of the thing. And I, I, and I have to agree now that I'm looking at how you organize the buildings, this kind of additive from the ground level approach, courtyard. Um, Roof forms are all kind of in different directions. Um, and maybe there needs to be a lot more harmony, and it has to do with the, from the ground up, the materials that you're experiencing, the techniques. Mm -hmm. So over the summer, every time, <laughs> you can look at it again. Sure. Well, just look at it. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll yeah. Until they get it more. Like, what you want. Sorry. You've seen, sorry. You've seen yeah. those historic wells. Mm -hmm. It has these giant buckets, it's up water. Or is it at a higher level as part of like this interesting experience rather than a much more heavy handed way of pulling water from the basin, taking it uphill, siphoning it, and treating it, and then bringing it back down to where it started. Mm -hmm. I think if it's something like that that you see along the countryside of Europe, wherever, where they have these, it's very good cake, but I think it ties into this idea of ruin and the old way of moving large volumes of water in an industrial setting, or an old industrial setting. I wonder in your section if you had something like a giant mill that's sort of like, like that, and maybe that's not even the right word for it, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Water well, right, that sort of picks, scoops up these water and transport them, and then it gets filtered and comes back down. It's a simple amateur mm -hmm. that then becomes part of your story, in terms of like the historicity. Yeah. Of your project. I definitely think expressing that um, in a similar way would definitely be a next move or next iteration. But great project. Thank you. You know, we're all architects, so we can't help but want to make these sort of modest edits uh, or recommendations. 
And um, along that line, I guess I would propose people like Henry Richardson, you know, having to do with the state work. But that's not the main reason I wanted the mic. Um, so, like everybody else, I really like your project. I want to make that clear. Thank you. Um, it, it, it grabs me emotionally, uh, probably in the same way that it grabbed you um, in your in our shared empathy, I would say, for both the natural environment, on the one hand, and these terrific old ruins, um, something about them, you know, this sort of emotional problem. Um, but isn't there a really weird contradiction here that, that if I move from the emotional to the intellectual level, mm -hmm. um, the main thing here was about addressing environmental issues, right? And then at the same time, you have this thing that you're drawn to emotionally, uh, this product of industrialization. And you're celebrating both. On the one hand, trying to save the natural environment. On the other hand, celebrating the very thing that's been primarily responsible for destroying it. Mm -hmm. This industrialization, this art, whole industrial economy, which is destroying this thing that... So there's a really weird um, contradiction built into this. And I wonder if you'd ever thought about that or what kind of thoughts you might have about Yeah, that. so I went through a few different iterations as to how to deal with the ruins themselves. Um, some of them I closed it completely, some I left it really open. In this way, I found uh, a way to give a little bit of architectural structure. Uh, but also to leave it open and in the and be able to degrade further over time uh, as vegetation uh, does its work on the structure. Uh, so, so it's okay to slowly collapse. Yeah, versus, you're overwhelmed by the restored vegetation and animal mm -hmm. environments. Right? Yeah, I think so. I want to go back That's to pretty the, good. I want to go back to the image thing for a second, and I think that. I think that the images that we saw, particularly in the animation, were exactly what Jake wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to go back to the challenge that Robert lays down for you, which is to sort of expand your repertoire. And I think actually, if more people were down at this end, you see at least one place where you've started to render with a different kind of graphic. Mm -hmm. and there's a kind of watercolor filter that's on this last one at the end here. And it, it, it takes away some of that edge of, you know, at the certain points, I'm not saying this to be rude or, you know, I'm just saying, you know me. I, 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 if I have a chance to jab you, I'm going to jab you. So, um, so, Jake, at a certain point, all I could have pictured was with the Anya like music in the background. Um, that there were hobbits here someplace, and they were all extremely happy. But I don't get that out of this. I don't get that out of this image over here. Okay. And I think there's something about crafting an image, and because images are not just projections of your will. There are also, they're also things that you interact with and you interpret. And part of the reason to adjust the way in which you make images is to allow yourself to reinterpret your own work so that you can then push it further. And you get to these questions where the sort of um, axiomatic uh, timber structure, which to you, and when I say axiomatic, ax axioms need no proof. They, mm -hmm. they stand for themselves, right? So the timber structure was like a given in your mind, and it was going to be there because it represented the forest, and then when it gets into this filter over here, it starts to blur a little bit, and it gets to, it, it, it softens that image a little bit, so that then you can begin to work with it. And I, that's that there be, it invokes a process that design thinking people talk about as the process of emergence. Mm -hmm. When you look at something that you've made yourself, and something new comes out of that thing that you didn't expect that dislodges you from that axiomatic view of the thing and allows you to start thinking about this thing in a new way and pushes the project forward. Because we've been at this point where, and, and I'm gonna say part of the problem of the study tool for this
this, and it's now I'm thinking back. It's in hindsight, I'm a great Monday morning quarterback for myself because now thinking back, the thing that the thing, the tool that you were using to study this thing was not this, not the digital media that we saw it presented so as much in the foreground today, but it was the MakerBot. I mean, you were making little planters and you were making all kinds of stuff in the MakerBot. And the problem with the MakerBot is that it is. Not, it doesn't really allow emergence in that way, does it? Because it has sharp edges and it's not malleable. It's not like it's not even like the little clay models that you had earlier on, where you could push your thumb could change the profile of something by accident and by virtue of that dislodge this sort of um, this the, the, dislodge your belief in the form that you made. Because the belief in the in the form that we make. Mm -hmm can actually be the thing that impedes us from actually going forward and thing. You have to you have to be you have to have the belief to make it, you have to have the faith to make it, you make that thing, and then you look at it and you have to become skeptical and you have to be willing to tear it apart. You have to be willing to kill it in order that it could be reborn again. This I think is the beginning of that over here. This image over here is beginning. You know, so I see I I, 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 I I celebrate the project too. I think you know we, we had back and forth questions as to where this was going all along. But I think that you have your you you are on track to finding that method to get yourself so you dislodge. Yeah, that's what, the first image that I take a picture. <laughs> just it's in front of us. It's just beautiful. Um, I don't know. I just what pointed attention uh, about the, your rooftop. Mm -hmm. Just a. Uh, an advice, pay attention that uh, when you have the opportunity to go upstairs, you see all the rooftop. And the rooftop, you know, is a, nowadays like the fifth facade. So it's something that you have to consider, especially the rooftop that you have in the back that is really, really big. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, one of the strategies that you already use as a chimney, you know, the like, well, it could be reinforced also for that kind of uh, relationship integration with your rooftop. And finally, my last one, synthetic consideration, is about, again, the ruins. I never see before that the new building actually you reuse the same stone, mm -hmm. but with a different stonework, a different geometry. Mm -hmm. That is very much here. It's very interesting. Um, just because I can hear on everybody else's criticism. You can listen. Every one of your, almost every one of your perspectives are taken from positions that you can't be. Right? I can't stand in water and do that. I can't stand in water here. I can't stand in water here. I'm not floating from 150 feet up. Which suggests to me that one of the studies you might start doing is putting yourself in the spaces mm -hmm. and making them. Not only pictorially as magic as they are, in fact, the smart to the magic of the architecture of the place. And again, these are all things that, you know, great. This is your shopping basket filled with things to do in the future, mm -hmm. right? Not, not criticism, but we have to be very careful, right? Because it's really great how far you've come. I appreciate really it. Really great. Okay, I just want to make sure. No, no negative. Yeah, right? Thank you very much. Cool. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jake. I think that um, the comments this afternoon have all really hit on the core of what Jake struggled with um, throughout the semester. Um, and I just want to thank you for bringing me along for this journey. Um, it's been really fantastic to see how much fun you're having with this project. I mean, these graphics just really, they highlight how much fun you had along the way. And, you know, you can see Gandalf in this image here. You missed it. <laughs> and that was Lord of the Rings music in the background. <laughs> So I, think I, that, I live with a hobbit, so you know, I know <laughs> that, that playfulness that you bring, I think, is really fantastic um, to the studio. Um, I've known Jake since our Architecture 403, so that's about two years ago. He was in my section, a senior studio. Um, and in retrospect, I can see kernels of this project all over his work in, in that studio. Um, he explored water wheels and um, how mollusks could clean water, and um, you could really see that that was the start of um, a thesis exploration, um, and it's really continued along the way. Um, and it's been fun to see how you've progressed in the Soil Decathlon and then moved on to this in your thesis. And I think that um, you're a steward of the environment in the 
truest sense of the word. You're an avid kayaker, you're a hiker, um, you love animals, big and small, um, and you're a designer that you, know, that, that you said that you wanted to instill empathy in people about the environment, I think really highlights the point of the thesis. So congratulations. Thanks. Right over on the other side.